Welcome. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. This evening is being presented both in person at Temple Beth Shalom, as well as via Zoom. This evening is being recorded and North Hempstead TV has requested a tape of this evening that they will air in the near future. At the end of the presentations, we will be taking questions from the audience here and on Zoom. If you are participating via Zoom, please ensure that your mic is on mute for the duration of the program and please type your question into the chat box. I will try to get to as many questions as possible. As Jews, we have suffered the wrath of anti-Semitism throughout the ages. We have known discrimination, hatred, and abuse since there came a Pharaoh unto the throne of Egypt who knew not Joseph, straight through to today. From Iran to Siberia, from Spain and Portugal to Germany and Russia, from Pittsburgh to Long Island, from being humili humiliated by signs of no Jews or dogs allowed, to being shoved into gas chambers. Jews are no strangers to experiencing the hatred of others. Unfortunately, we seem to be living in a world where unbridled bias and hatred have once again reared their ugly heads. Racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim, anti-immigration, anti-LGBTQIA, sentiments seem to have become the norm in much of the world. We cannot allow that to continue. So much of this hatred is predicated on ignorance. In believing the lies that have been told throughout the ages, Jews drink the blood of children or Kiddush. Blacks are all dirty and lazy. Immigrants just want to take your jobs and then they want to murder you and take your money. Gays are all pedophiles waiting to rape your children, etc., etc. This year, the Social Action Committee of Temple Beshalom is dedicating our programming to shining the light on the dark ignorance that allows this hatred to grow. This evening, we are privileged to have Dr. David Rosenthal, founding medical director of Northwell Health Center for Transgender Care, and Jessica Potok, transgender model artist and musician. Join us to explore the journey of the authentic self, learning about and understanding the transgender community. It is with great pleasure that I now introduce <laughs> Temple Beth Shalom's esteemed associate rabbi, Rabbi Kara Weinstein Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Wendy and Rose, and thank you all for being here tonight. Can you see me over the laptop? Can I? Wait, if I move the laptop like that, is that the other way? I'm good? Okay. All right. Aim kol chadash tachat hashamesh. Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, in our Hebrew Bible said, there is nothing new under the sun. The concept that we're talking about tonight, the transgender experience, is a new thing. And it's a new thing in Judaism, right? The product of a liberal postmodern orientation? Not quite. The idea of gender identities that go beyond the binary structure of male and female is not new in Judaism. <clears throat> it's a part of Judaism that dates back to our earliest rabbinic texts from 2000 years ago, the Mishnah and following that the Talmud. Our ancient sages, the rabbis of old, acknowledged a variety of gender identities. Some of these gender identities map on to gender identities that we recognize today in our expanded understanding of the world, and some of them are a little bit different. So just to give you one example, the rabbis of the Mishnah and the Talmud recognized a category of person called androgynous, which sort of is a cognate word to what we might call androgynous today, 
And when the rabbis of old said androgynous, they meant somebody who has both male and female sexual characteristics, somebody that today some people call intersex. Interestingly enough, the Mishnah and the Talmud, our ancient rabbinic texts, state that an androgynous has a very specific identity, portfolio, I guess you could say, in terms of halacha, Jewish law. Because of many, as many of you know, Jewish law is very gender specific, right? There are some mitzvot, some commandments that are incumbent upon men specifically. There are some mitzvot that are incumbent upon women specifically, like going to the mikvah or lighting Shabbat candles. And then there are some mitzvot that are sort of for everybody. So interestingly enough, when the rabbis of old talked about this person, this intersex person, the androgynous, they said that that person was treated in some categories of Jewish law like a man, in others like a woman, in others like both, like somebody who was responsible for both male and female commandments, and in some other categories of Jewish law and practice, they were treated as a, a completely unique kind of being that wasn't subject to the laws of men or women. And the androgynous is just one example. The rabbis understood, I think, about five different gender categories in all. So the rabbis of old weren't necessarily talking about a transgender experience the way that we understand it today. That wasn't a reality for them, right? They didn't need to comment on that religiously because people weren't undergoing a gender transition because it wasn't something people could do societally. Right, so the rabbis didn't feel a need to comment on it. But to me, the fact that they recognized fluidity in terms of gender, the fact that they recognized the existence of something beyond just you're born a man and it makes you do this and you're like that forever, or you're born a woman and it makes you like this and you're like that forever. The fact that they understood more than just that rigid binary concept of male or female from birth to me, it teaches us an important lesson that when we in the Jewish community today talk about the Jewish community recognizing an understanding of gender that transcends rigid and binary ideas and language, we're not really talking about something new. We're not talking about a new fad. We're talking about something that has very deep roots within our Jewish tradition. So yes, I said there's nothing new under the sun, but I want to qualify that. Having a nuanced understanding of gender and sexuality is not new in Judaism. But now, as we know, there are mechanisms by which an individual can complete a gender transition. That is something that is new in terms of the, the scope of the human experience. And it's a good thing that we've evolved in that way. And the ways in which the Jewish community has begun to respond to these evolving elements of the transgender experience are new. And the fact that we have begun, perhaps slowly to respond in our modern Jewish community is a very good thing. In our responses to our new understanding of these realities, the most crucial thing is that we base everything we do on two key concepts in Judaism. The concept of kavod habriot, the dignity of all of God's created beings, and the concept of tselem Elohim, the idea reflected in our very first Torah portion that we read in our Torah every year, a foundational idea in Judaism that every human being is created in God's image and every human being is a reflection of the divine. So where does conservative Judaism, the space that we occupy in the Jewish world, stand on all of this? The conservative movements, rabbinical assemblies, committee on Jewish law and standards passed a tshuva, a rabbinic responsum in 2019 affirming that individuals who are transgender should be known within the Jewish community as within the community at large by their publicly declared gender. 
for ritual purposes as well as for legal purposes. So the rabbinical assembly has affirmed that if you have transitioned from female to male and you want to get married within Judaism, if you have declared yourself to be male and you have undergone that transition, Jewish law and your Jewish community needs to affirm the gender that you've transi transitioned to. I also want to share with you a resolution that came out actually back in 2016, not so long ago, but maybe it seems a little bit long ago as we talk about progress in this area. And this was from the conservative movement's rabbinical assembly. And they put out a resolution affirming the rights of transgender and gender nonconforming people. So this is what the rabbinical assembly said. Be it resolved that the rabbinical assembly affirm its commitment to the full welcome, acceptance, and inclusion of people of all gender identities in Jewish life and general society. And be it resolved that the rabbinical assembly encourage all programs affiliated with the conservative movement, including seminaries, schools, synagogues, camps, and communal and professional organizations to educate themselves and their employees about the needs of transgender and gender nonconforming people so as to create fully inclusive settings. And I like this part because it focuses on our youth. Be it resolved that the rabbinical assembly encourage all conservative movement synagogues, camps, schools, and affiliated organizations to work toward becoming explicitly welcoming, safe spaces for transgender and gender nonconforming people, and evaluate their physical sight needs, workplace needs, and language that impact gender and gender expression. So just to take back a step back from the resolution for a moment, that means that not only do we have to make sure to be welcoming and inclusive in our synagogues, we have to make sure that our youth that may be transgender or non-binary, that they are accepted in conservative Hebrew schools, in conservative day schools like Schechter and conservative camps like Ramah, this has to happen for every age group and on every level within our organizations. And then the resolution goes on to conclude. Be it further resolved that the rabbinical assembly encourage conservative organizations to educate their constituencies about the need of transgender and gender nonconforming people to be known by the identity name and pronoun of their choice. So our movement within the Jewish world wants us to educate ourselves and each other about how to be truly welcoming and inclusive and to meet the needs of those in our communities and near our communities that are non-binary and that are transgender. Thank God we're making a start in doing that tonight. We're educating ourselves and each other. And if anyone says to you, what does your brand of Judaism say about transgender people? What does your synagogue say about this? You can tell them the ideas that we just talked about from that beautiful rabbinical assembly resolution, that this is what conservative Judaism says, that it's our responsibility to be inclusive, to be welcoming, and most of all, to be affirming. These are the teachings of our Judaism. May we do our best to fulfill them. Thank you. Want me to introduce our next speaker. And I personally have been waiting with bated breath to hear her story. Uh, next, we're going to hear a personal narrative from Jessica Potok. Uh, as Wendy mentioned and Rose, she is a transgender model, artist, and musician. And Jessica, we are so grateful and honored that you've chosen to spend time with us this evening and share your insights and your story with us. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Jessica Potak. 
or cute Jess ally if you're following me on Instagram. I'm a post-op transgender woman, and I'm here to share my story of my life and the empowerment of myself in the process. At the end of the presentations, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. And um, if anybody else has any other special needs, you're more than welcome to come up to me privately, and I'm more than happy to speak to you about that. So for some background, as a transgender woman, I was assigned male at birth. So all my external features were male, but my brain was hardwired as female. With transgender people, this happens because in the womb, primary sex characteristics are formed early in gestation, while the fetal brain is developed later and imprinted with the gender identity, which can differ from the primary sex, sex characteristics. I have a little presentation here. And... Mm -mm. And so how do we share this with everything? GDF's the host. Does this take over the entire screen? And is it showing that? It's sharing your screen, right? Google. Oh, it's a share the right thing. You can just make it a little bigger. We're in Google Sheets. Yeah. Oops. Not that. I could just talk. just talk and you can give your slides if you want just by going through them normally like that and it's actually going to show the majority of things. Okay. Cool. I'm done with that. Okay. Perfectly. I don't want me to do that. Okay. I was born September 9th, 1981. I was a healthy baby and came into life with a loving family, which included a brother or Carl a few years later. We grew up middle class right here in Roslyn, where I lived up until my mid thirties. My parents are hardworking and well aligned people. My mother was a nurse and my father worked as a dental technician. This is me as an early child there. Oh, my cuteness. Something was off. As a child, I was very aware of myself and my surroundings. Even though I had a relatively happy childhood, with good experiences, I always felt wrong and displaced, like something was just off. I always had an odd fascination about women and women's clothing. I secretly always thought that that should be me to push those, that that should be me. But, push, uh, but I pushed those feelings aside because that just made no sense to me at, the, at an early age. As a child, we pick up on gender norms very quickly through observation and imprint that to our subconscious. Even though I had a few boys as friends, a majority were girls, I found it difficult to socialize. In kindergarten, I repeated because I didn't get along with anyone, not my first class at least. I realize now that was a result of my gender, ma gender dysphoria manifesting. I was definitely an atypical quote, quote, boy. I was very docile. I wasn't into competition, or much sports. I had a love of playing with dolls and my action figures frequently had relationships. I had many girls as friends, which felt very comfortable to me. When we used to play, I was slightly jealous as I wanted to be girl, a girl too. I always wanted to play dress up, but the cultural norms that were printed in my head always told me that that was wrong. So I never let anybody know. 
My family was mostly accepting of my preferences. Luckily, my father wasn't big into sports, so that wasn't necessarily crammed down my throat. They let me have and play with Barbies and have my own kitchen set, which was heavily skewed as a girl's toy at the time. I also loved My Little Ponies. For my eighth birthday, all I wanted was a My Little Pony castle. I was overjoyed to receive it as a gift, but I also got a very masculine looking bike too. I feel like that was my dad's way of trying to balance the gift out. With all the shows I watched, I always associated with female characters. I wanted to be them so badly. Anytime there was any show or movie that dealt with transformation, it always hit me very deep. I always imagined that I could be changed into a woman too. Now keep in mind, at that age, I was very so aware of the social norms and I knew I was abnormal, but it wasn't enough to make me stop or change my direction. Actually, that Boy Scout picture, I believe, was in this temple, too. <laughs> By the time I was in middle school, I had myself mostly figured out. I remember watching my female professors and being so jealous. I fre frequently daydreamed about being them and how wonderful it must be. I started dressing in women's clothing behind closed doors. It was an amazing, it was an amazing feeling. I felt euphoric, euphoric and so normal. Since both my parents worked, I had a period of time where the house was all to myself during the afternoon. And so I ended up dressing up on the regular and just hanging out and watching TV, just like that. As puberty began and my sexuality started coming online, my thoughts and feelings leaned more towards one of a young girl. I felt wrong. I felt shame. I felt confusion. I was scared. Eventually, I came to the conclusion on my own, without any external influence, that I really was a woman inside. And I wanted to live as such. I distinctly remember making a plan. I already picked up uh, I was already picked on at school because I was so different. And so I would have to wait until after high school to live as a woman, as I didn't want any more negative attention. I also want to mention at that time, there was also no real good transgender influence in any of the media, magazines, or pretty much anywhere. It was the very dawn of the internet and things were very closed off. I never saw a transgender person other than as a joke in, in some sort of a show or a movie. And that was the only influence I ever saw. Around this time, someone did find out that I was dressing in women's clothing and I was approached about it. It was a terrifying conversation because this was never in the open. I was told that it was wrong. It was something that I really shouldn't be doing. And at that point, I really began to repress my feelings very hard. I tried to be normal and just told myself that my desire to be a woman was just a dark fantasy. And other boys probably had the same feelings too, right? And it was just something that was never talked about. I carried that, I carried the weight that if anybody felt, fell out my feelings, I carried the weight that if anybody knew my feelings, I would lose my friends and everybody I loved. Changes from puberty started and my body started to change. I tried to fight back. I tried to shave myself anywhere the hair popped up, but I soon found that this was a losing battle, especially with my Russian genetics. <laughs> I continued to move on with life. Come high school. Come high school, I had a wonderful group of friends we called the crew. We were always having fun laughing and doing stupid things. I started playing bass in a band with some friends and it became a really big focus for us. It made it significantly easier to live a relatively happy life and made me ignore my gender dysphoria. I still never felt right, and I still felt displaced inside. I got along well with women, but always like a friend, and I had a hard time attracting women. I avoided my high school prom as I really had nobody to ask. Things like that hit me emotionally pretty hard. I continued to, to repress my feelings in my 20s, and they were so packed down, approaching it was just terrifying. 
I can continue to have an awful time with women and felt very alone despite having very good friends. I was still living in the shadows. I was secretly attracted to men and I acted on my feelings behind closed doors. I felt lost and directionless in my life. Frequent drug, drug use became a coping mechanism to ignore the reality of my feelings. By 24, and a lot of research on the psychology of attracting women, I was finally able to get a steady girlfriend. While this seemed to be a very big achievement for myself, and I thought it would be the cure-all for all these feelings, I still ended up feeling the same inside. At 26, the repression of my true self led me down, led me to a downward spiral. A downward spiral. Depression and anxiety became a massive limiting factor in my life. I had another relationship with a woman, and we had a daughter, Leah, together by surprise. This is a big wake up call for my life as I needed to clean up my act and I realized that my feelings had to be put on the back burner. I, might, I knew my life was now about Leah. The relationship didn't last and in less than two years we split apart and I took full residential custody at the age of 28. As a single parent, I was confronted by the situation of being around lots of other women. The amount of single fathers with custody is still quite low, even to this day. I began to socialize and relate more with the women in daily parental situations and felt much more comfortable and at ease than with the fathers, which I always felt a disconnect. In Girl Scouts, they always said, you're like one of the girls. I continued to date women, but I still had difficulties. And there's some pictures of me in my previous life with my beautiful daughter. In September, in September 2014, I met someone that changed everything. I met Jen. We both fell in love instantly, like in one of those romance movies. I wanted to marry her the second date. Things progressed, and a year and a half later, we moved in together. We planned to be together forever and have a family. After living together for a little, the cracks in the relationship started to show. There was a disconnect that neither one of us could put a finger on. It drove her to, to depression and me to a lot of hesitancy. I still fantasize about men. And when things were tense, I got the feeling of why am I pretending to be this masculine form? I continued to push it down as, as it was just crazy feelings that aro arose just because of our relationship issues. I knew our love was very real and it was very undeniable. We kept on trying to make it work, but we kept on crashing harder. When One day I came home and I found she was packing her things. I broke down. Even though I was enduring a fair amount of mental stress in the relationship, my heart was shattered. Sorry. This was the summer of 2017. I was broken, but I was trying to hold myself together. I strive, I strive to pick myself up and be the best person I could be. I went to the gym four to times a week, four to five times a week, and put on a ton of, ton of muscle. I started going out more and becoming very social. In an attempt of getting over my ex, I started I started dating again very quickly. On paper, I was doing well, but the feeling of wrong still persisted. I ended up start I ended up starting cr to cross dress again. I didn't really stop. It was just very infrequent. Maybe I would do it again when everyone was asleep late at night every few months. I started cross dressing and it made me feel comfortable and normal. I was magnetically drawn to it. I felt beautiful, attractive and sexy, and I actually liked how I started to look in the mirror. I was feeding an internal need that had been locked away and demonized for so long. 25 years at that point. 
Soon cross-dressing became an everyday occurrence after I put my daughter to sleep. I couldn't wait until the day was done and I could continue to experiment my looks. It didn't take long for me to come to, to the acceptance that I was a cross-dresser. I began to start taking pictures of myself and found a community on Reddit where I could interact with others like myself. I used a secret alias, Jessica, and coined my username, Cute Jess Ally. While there, I read many stories of people who thought they were a cross-dresser, but discovered they were in fact transgender. I was fascinated, but at that point I was very aware, unaware of the trans community because it wasn't something that was talked about much and not giving a good deal of media attention. Luckily online, the community was large and there were many people freely talking about their feelings and their journeys. I was captivated and honestly started to get a little jealous. These were vibrant and beautiful women who were living according to their own rules. I spent weeks seeking out trans perspectives and reading as much as I possibly could. I was shocked at how the experiences were eerily similar to my own. I was beginning to think, maybe I am trans. But being inspired by the beautiful trans community, I decided to buy some cheap makeup from the dollar store, which is absolutely terrifying. I watched some brief makeup tutorials and went to work. When I finished, I was floored, admiring myself I burst out crying. I never thought I could look so pretty and feel so good. I never wanted that feeling to end. Every fiber of my existence was telling me this is more true to myself than I'd ever felt. It was, I was so confused. I had these feelings for my whole life, but they seem so wrong, but yet so right. The next month I was distracted as could be. The only thing I could think of, I did more of the same. I, the next month I was as distracted as I could be. It was the only thing I could think of. I did more of the same, relating with others' experiences and dressing. I also learned about transition and how trans people went on HRT or hormone replacement therapy to chemically change their bodies to run hormonally as the opposite sex. This in turn sets your body off on a second puberty which for trans women allows them to feminize, grow breasts, and mentally change to a female perspective. I never knew this. I wanted it so bad. I became hooked on HRT timeline videos that showed how much people would change over time with HRT. Soon it wasn't a want. Once my mind realized this was a possibility, I couldn't let go of it. I needed it. This finally came to a tipping point. I made the most challenging revelation of my life, that I was really a woman inside. For a day, I felt amazing that I, again, had figured this out. The feelings of wanting to live as a woman at 12 were as real as they could be. And I started to unpack a life's worth of repression. It wasn't a small amount. Dysphoria about my being started spewing out like lava. My anxiety kicked into full panic mode and I could barely function. I was so overwhelmed and scared and I, I felt so alone. I was terrified about telling anyone. Based on my earlier experiences, I felt like no one would ever accept me and it made, and it made everything that much worse. What would happen with my daughter? There was so much. I was about to crack big time. I approached my mother and had the hardest conversation of my entire life. She was beyond supportive and I felt so much better afterwards. I knew that I wanted to get on HRT as soon as possible and that I wanted bottom surgery. This was a little bit much for her at that point, but I knew my course. I created a timeline for my transition and knew it would be about three years of transition for all to be said and done. I was pretty much dead on. Oddly enough, my ex-gen, who I hadn't seen in months, resurfaced and seemed to be interested in trying again. She had changed and seemed to be doing better than ever. It killed me. I knew that I had to tell her, even though it would spell doom for a romantic relationship. She was very concerned, yet she was amazing and supportive at the same time. She was a makeup pro. She taught me more about techniques and products. She, helped, she also helped me with my looks and was the first person to bring me into the world as my feminine self. Slowly, I began, began coming out to people and the family closest to me. 
I dreaded it. It felt like a heart attack every time. I felt like I wouldn't be accepted. And every time I came out, I had to be prepared to lose that person. I was extremely lucky that I was supported by virtually everybody that I knew. This is very unusual, as many people lose friends and family to those that don't understand. Again, I was extremely lucky. And there's us together as we were, she was starting to usher me into a new life. The pain from dysphoria was hard. Knowing I was a woman inside made it so much harder to present male. I couldn't wait for the day that I could live as my true self. The only thing that made the dysphoria better was to work on my transition. I made strides to change my body and my appearance. I started laser hair removal to clear my facial hair. I went on a specialized diet to lose fat and trim the muscle that I built up just months prior. Socially, I started wearing nail polish in public for a slow rollout, which got people at work gossiping. I also started seeing a gender psychologist regularly to sort out my mind and get myself prepared to talk to my daughter. Out of anything, the fear of causing her some mental harm from transitioning was absolutely the worst part. She's my everything, and I was petrified at the outcome. When I finally told her, she was so understanding and loving, the emotional maturity of her at 10 just blew me away. She was actually so excited, she ended up telling all her friends at school which forced me to have conversations with her teachers and friends' parents a little sooner than I would have liked. Because come December 9th, 2018, I was finally allowed to start on HRT under the supervision of Planned Parenthood, which wasn't a decision to be taken lightly. It takes time for the changes, but it is magical. It changes your skin, sex drive, smell, scent, scent, uh, Depth of emotions, body shape, face shape, fat distribution, hair growth, eye shape, and allows you to grow breasts. For me, the mental effects were an absolute blessing. Within two days of being on HRT, I felt an intense sense of calm. The, the, the dysphoria that I mentioned that I'd been banging on my door had quieted. My low-lying depression, my feeling of wrong, and my anxiety that had been lingering so long had also basically vanished. To top it off, it also reduced my ADD. HRD, HRT had been a miracle for me. The happiness I found I didn't even know existed. Almost everybody noticed too. I had many people say, I've never seen you smile so much. My, also, my daughter also says she likes me better as a woman. It helped me in big ways to understand what, is she, what she is feeling while, while starting puberty, especially since I wasn't very far ahead of her. There are a few parents that can say they went through puberty with their daughter. I got like two more pages. Even though I was on HRT, I was still not out to the entire world. Even though I wanted to live at my true self so badly, I was, wasn't comfortable enough with myself. I still had lots of people to come out to and I didn't think that I would be passable enough to go into the world. I was able to celebrate Christmas and New Year's with family and that I was just over the moon. Come March, I was comfortable enough to come out fully at work. Luckily, people noticed I had been changing slowly and didn't come in as a huge surprise, except for one person, almost everybody was accepting. Again, I was very lucky, and this is usually not the norm. February, 20, February 18th, 2019, I made it official. I announced on Facebook that I was transgender. The next few years became a rebirth. As my body and mind slowly changed, I began to come out of the shadows and find my place in the world. I was always very to myself because I never felt right, but now I felt I began to feel good about myself and build up love for myself. I became proud of who I was, and the process of transitioning and being in public gave me a strength to ignore the people who would shoot me down. I realized it doesn't matter what other people think as long as you love yourself. I began to post more on social media and started an Instagram account to document my journey. My hope was that I could reach people that needed the positivity. It was my way of giving back to the community that helped me find myself. I was surprised how fast I grew. 
Due to my inner strength, many looked up to me and people started contacting me in droves for help with their own situation. I quick, quickly realized that I had a very good way with people and I could guide people that, that had nowhere to turn and, and change the course of their lives. I was able to empower people to be the best version of themselves. And that in turn gave me su such a deep satisfaction and purpose that I, that I never knew before. As I grew, more and more looked up to me as a role model and more and more came to me for help. After COVID and I left the marketing industry, which I worked in for 20 years to be with my daughter, I put a bigger emphasis on my online presence. The volume of people that were attracted by my light was almost unreal. I never took this lightly as I was very happy to give up things like television or other recreational activities to keep my arms outstretched. I learned that the power I learned the power that one person can make in the world, and I realized that the potential of every person is much greater than they could ever imagine. In this time, I also began working on my last stage of transition, which was my bottom surgery. It's an absolutely massive surgery and requires many steps and approvals. In this time, I, sought, I was sought out by online people in the media and the modeling industry. I began conversations with large companies, was offered an audition for a TV show, given an opportunity to walk runway, and was asked to compete in a modeling competition. But this was not the time for it. But it did make me realize I had something big to offer eventually. My life was on hold and my main focus was finishing my transition. January 21st, 2021, I went to NYU and under the scale, skilled hands, oh shoot, I missed it too, I'm so sorry. And under the skilled hands of Dr. Rachel Blue Bond, I had my bottom surgery. I woke up and while I was in a tremendous amount of pain, a massive weight was lifted. I was finally complete. When I finally got to my room, I burst out in tears of happiness. I spent the no next five days in the hospital and then came home for the next trial of life. Recovery was tough and, I, and it felt like it would never end. It was two months of very uncomfortable living and the third, I was slowly able to get back on my feet. The time was not wasted though. I continued to help other people in the community and spent a great amount of time sorting myself out and doing inner work. The, I harbored many ill feelings towards the life I was given and the people that hurt me. I had learned the value of forgiveness and, and for the hardships in my life and the negativity that was projected towards myself. Letting go of all of that negativity and replacing it with love and positivity brought me to an incredible place where my mind and soul were in harmony. After the three months, I went in for my next, next surgery, my breast augmentation, which was basically a cakewalk compared to the last surgery. I bounced back relatively quickly and started getting my body back together. After three weeks post-op, I was reunited with the gym after four months of being away. It had been such a hard road with my body surgery that With, with months where it was hard to even walk. So th this was an incredible accomplishment, accomplishment for myself. I worked diligently to get my body back. And within a month, I was back in full swing again. At this point in my life, I felt better than I ever did. My mind, body, and soul were in alignment. My daughter, Leah, was progressing. And I was so proud that I was on the other side of the toughest experiences in my life. I considered my transition finished and I was thriving. I set a goal to achieve my seemingly impossible dreams of doing modeling, acting, and creating art at the end of summer. Long gone were the days of me wanting to hide myself. I found an inner glow that I needed to share with the world. Everywhere I went, people commented about how I shine, and I inspired them to live their own lives to the fullest. I found a love of being in front of the camera and putting my best foot forward for the transgender community. My goals are now to be as visible as possible so that I can create more awareness of the transgender community and so that I could do my part to normal, normalize transgenderism in society. There's so much work to do as acceptance isn't so widespread yet. Luckily, the media and corporate America are catching up and now actively starting to spread inclusive, inclusivity through media. The last three months for me have been a whirlwind as I hit the ground running and I gained very attraction very quickly. I, I began being cast for roles specifically because I was transgender. I learned, very, I learned last Thursday that I'll be part of a year long media campaign with Target. It all feels like a dream. In two days, I'm flying to Destin, Florida 
I'm competing in the Miss Fashion Global Modeling Competition with a second competition following in December. I'm proud to represent the community and make a statement that just because you're trans, it doesn't make you any less of a person. We are deserving of human rights, of dignity, children, health care, equal and equal opportunities like everybody else. Oh, I, I do have so much to say, but I do need to cap this off. Living your authentic self is important for the LGBT community, but it's not strictly a transgender narrative. Settling because it's easy will never bring you a life that's rich with the things that are most important to you. We all have dreams and aspirations, and we all have the power to chase those dreams. The best things in life definitely aren't easy. The biggest secret in the universe is love and acceptance. We are all one big family, and we need to hold hands together and support and uplift each other. Be grateful for everything you have. Start every day and be grateful for the ones we love, our friends, our lives, our country, our opportunities, and the beautiful world that God has given us. Well, thank you, everybody. And good night. Well, what an empowering message. Let's give her another round of applause, please. So I really wanted to thank um, Jess for being able to come forward. Every time I'm able to speak with someone um, from the transgender experience and I'm able to kind of be able to have that discussion, I feel that the, the journey that we're sharing is kind of a window into different people's lives and everyone's journey is different. And I think we all know our different journeys that we've had in our experiences. But I think what's important to remember is, is that some journeys are sometimes easier than others. And I think that individuals of the trans experience don't typically have the easiest of journeys. But I think what's important to remember is, is their journeys are valuable, they're important. People aren't doing this, people aren't identifying because they're unsure about what's going on. This is something that is very near and dear to themselves and something that is very essential to who they are and how we need to be authentic in ourselves. When I started out, I was, I was an internal medicine doctor um, that actually came to Northwell Health and spent a year in the laboratory. As I did that, I actually was able to start a fellowship in allergy immunology, and then instead of going on and practicing medicine like most people, I decided I was going to go do a, um, a PhD at the Feinstein Institute where I was able to get additional training. So during those years, I was able to kind of do that. And afterwards, I was interested in LGBT health and HIV care, and I started taking care of young adults living with HIV. And as I did that, I was an early proponent for being able to give HIV prevention tools to individuals and started embedding healthcare services within LGBT agencies. And as I did that, people started coming forward to me and they said, where can I get resources for being trans in Long Island? How can I find someone who can provide mental health care? Who can prescribe hormones? How can I be able to talk to someone? How can I find someone that's out there? And so I was able to do two things. One, I was able to reach out to the community that was here on Long Island and back there, and I'm sure Samantha remembers, the community was smaller and more closely knit and not really as open and people weren't able to find people as easily. I think what's important to know is, is that we're able to see new resources and be able to find new individuals that we're able to then reach out to. And I was able to go to Northwell Health and was able to take a group of experts from all sorts of different specialties, individuals that had expertise in endocrinology and had expertise in um, mental health, had expertise in all sorts of different areas. And together we were able to pull together a program bringing together of the 13 service lines at Northwell Health, eight of the different branches of Northwell Health um, that had provided clinical care, including surgery, medicine, endocrinology, pediatrics and adults, OBGYN, fertility services. And by bringing together those resources, what we were able to do was be able to start to provide resources for individuals that were trans living in Long Island. It's a long journey. We actually were able to finally first have our space that was a dedicated space. It's an LGBT affirming space that exists dedicated within the health system um, in Long Island. And we were able to open that space in the middle of the pandemic in June of 2020. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and there's a lot of information that we still need to learn. There's a couple of basic terms that I'd like to share with everyone and be able to talk very briefly about. One of them is, is going to be that I want people to understand that every one of the trans experience is not the same. We had a very, very powerful story and a very, very powerful experience that Jess was able to share with us about her life. And I think that it's really important for us to understand that. 
I'm very lucky and fortunate that I've been able to have about a thousand individuals, 1200 individuals at this point, actually from that, share their narratives with me, share their stories with me, tell me their coming out story and tell me how they became their authentic self. And every story is different. Every individual is different. Every person has different needs. Some people are being pushed away by their family. Some people are embraced by their family. Some people have an easier path than others. Some people just want to be able to be themselves and have their gender identity, which Cecilia Gentili, who's a trans activist and, research, and person who's also an actress, always taught, taught me initially that being transgender and identifying your gender identity is what's between your ears. It's not what's between your hips. So knowing that someone's trans is important for us to realize, regardless if they look trans to you, sound trans to you, have had surgery, are wearing makeup, or have their long hair or not, someone's gender identity is intrinsic to themselves. And so what we need to do is we need to respect all people for being themselves and letting people be their authentic selves. I teach healthcare providers that we can't look across a waiting room and be able to say to someone, that this individual is Hispanic or Caucasian or their preferred language is English or Spanish or French or Creole. We don't know that by looking at someone. And our minds are pre-primed due to something called unconscious bias that we immediately look across the room and we say man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, 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 man. That's the way we're taught. That's the way we grew up. That's what we learned when we originally came, came in through society. And what we need to do is we need to take a step back and we just say, we're not going to let unconscious bias drive what we're going to do. We're going to treat everyone with respect. We're going to ask everyone the questions they need to be asked. And we're going to be able to provide the kind of health care that individuals need to make sure that their needs are being met. One thing that we've done a lot of is, is not having people have to come forward and say, call me something else. And I think that's very important to me. The story that I tell all the time is my grandfather's Yichun Livracha of blessed memory. He was named Jacob Joseph Singman. He went by Joe. So every time he got him into the hospital, people said, Jacob, what can I do for you? Jacob, what can I do for you? And he said, my name's not Jacob, my name's Joe. So I think that it's important regardless if you're trans or you're not, we need to ask our patients what terms we'd like for use for them, what pronouns they need to be using, and also what name they wanna be called because I think that it's very important that regardless of the name is a legal name change on a document or not, people need to be treated with respect and dignity for who they are and have the names that they, they want to be able to share. I can speak for hours on this topic. I just had a conference that we were able to have um, with the trans community that we ran at Hofstra University just, yes, just yesterday, actually, um, and we had a six hour conference. So we can discuss this for many, many, many hours. And I hope this is the beginning of an opening of a conversation. We can have additional voices and additional information we can share about the trans community and the LGBT community at large. I think it's important that we give people voices, that we make sure that the importance of the sexual minority population, those individuals of the LGBT community and the sexually minoritiest of the population, the trans community are heard and are welcomed not only at our hospitals, not only in our doctor's practices, but also in our Kahila Kadosha and our holy sanctuaries and in our communities that we see all over. The last thing I'd like to bring forward is, is unfortunately, there's still a lot of hatred that exists against individuals for all sorts of reasons, based on your race, your religion, based on the language you speak, the color of your skin, your sexual orientation and your gender identity. And this week during Transgender Day of Remembrance, Transgender Week of Remembrance, we actually remember that in the United States, there are 44 individuals who passed away due to transgender violence here in the United States since January of this year. These are real people and I'm having some technical difficulties and I have pictures of the 44 faces and I'll be able to share them with you later. But these are real individuals that we need to make sure that we're aware of and that we need to stop the hatred, the discrimination, and the challenges that exist for this community. I show a pyramid, and if we can remove the bottom level of the pyramid, the stereotypes, then that breaks away the foundation, preventing discrimination, stigma, and action against communities. And so what we need to do is we need to really come together as a Jewish community and as a community of individuals to make sure that we're here to take care of our brothers and sisters, our sisters and brothers, 
and those people that define themselves as non-binary or non or um, gender non-conforming. And we need to make sure that we're able to provide those kinds of homes for people to feel comfortable in all of our settings and the places that we are and for all that we do. I'm happy to answer many questions and I think Jess will also. I know we went a little over on the timing of the program, so I wanted to leave time for questions if that's okay, Wendy. Um, I'm gonna transfer the... I can reclaim. You pardon? I can reclaim it. You can reclaim it? Go for it. Yeah. She's the host. Um, and with that, we're very, very thrilled to be able to, I think, uh, start a discussion and be able to have some interactions. Um, Wendy, would you like all three of us up here? Would you like just me up here? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. We'll tag team. If anybody has any questions, please put them in chat. If anybody here would like to ask, thank you. Please. How is coordinating for you for expanded funds to do the research that hasn't been done? Is I'm a cardiologist. So it's a great question. There are some resources that are available. Let me repeat the question. Thank you so much. Um, so Dr. Rosen was able to ask, Stacey was able to ask um, an important question about the ability to be able to find new research opportunities to be able to treat and address needs of the transgender community. I think in the bigger question, what kind of resources exist out there for financial support of being able to come up with medical research to be able to address things. And I think specifically with regarding cardiovascular health, how do we really make sure that we can um, understand what's going on and we can make sure that we're able to answer new questions. I'm going to take a step back to kind of answer that because I think there's a lot that, that's there. Um, the first piece of it is, is really that um, until um, the ACA was passed or Obamacare was passed, really transgender healthcare occurred in small niches throughout the United States um, and private doctors that did fee for services um, that had very high prices and had niche communities. When that changed, kind of healthcare started turning over. And so we started seeing, as we started seeing academic medical institutions that were able to start engaging in this healthcare. And I became really starting, became involved with the community in 2014 and we founded the center in 2016, which kind of follows along the timeline and Planned Parenthood started a very similar time, time at that point. Before that, everyone was in the city. You were at LGBT specific agencies largely and not typically at larger healthcare institutions. And you had private doctors that were doing plastic surgery in a few situations. We've seen a significant change where academic medicine, research, and evidence-based um, findings have really been able to come out and be able to help us understand this. We're able to create education, and so I teach the medical school to all of the new residents. We talk about individuals that are trans. We talk about resources that we're doing, and we're looking for the future, and hopefully we'll have some individuals that are here that will help us be standardized patients, that will help us actually be able to create simulation laboratories where people can present with chest pain, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, but they're of the trans experience. And they need to not only treat the medical issues properly, but treat the people properly. Mm -hmm. And I think that takes education and resources. So we're continuing to grow that. Additionally, medical findings and research are coming out. We're working with endocrinology on several research projects right now and other things. The NIH does have some allocated funding for transgender research. It's not as widespread as I'd like it to be. Um, and I think that it's important that we continue to look at things and I'd love to partner with you in taking a look at what's going on because as we're looking at women's health, and I know that you've been a big advocate for women's health, obviously for the health system, but um, also including transgender care, I think you just published in this area as well. Um, it's important that we really do continue to expand the resources and the knowledge that's there because there's so much still to learn and so much that we still need to work on. There is advocacy, but everyone's fighting for funding. So it's a challenging, it's a challenging um, forefront. And I think that um, there's certainly more work to be done. But look how much has changed in the past few That's years. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's only been a few years. Right. And, so and, and I actually, it's a good point because I talk about for people, I say, when I'm meeting someone who's younger and, and with children, we actually talk about, um, it's important that people understand that, that being trans as a, as a child or something is something that's persistent, insistent, and consistent. 
And so what happens is if these things are existing throughout childhood, we need to do that. So I may see a younger child and say, let your kid play with the toys they want to play with, let them wear the clothes they want to wear with, and there's nothing else that we need to do. But what we do need to talk about is, is at what point do we change what we're, we're able to do and being able to figure out how we're going to be able to move this forward. But in addition to that, it's really important that we realize that it's not just a medical or a psychological need that those families have, it's really also a communal need. And so there are organizations that are here in Long Island that do phenomenal work. Um, and we're very fortunate here to have um, from PFLAG, Samantha Kutcher, um, who's able to be here to be able to talk about some of who's also knows the great work that's there because what's important is we can get families together. We can get people together to talk with other families. We can get kids to talk to other kids. We can get parents to talk to other parents. And the fact is, is we can share our knowledge, we can share our information. So it's important that not only are we providing information from a medical and a mental health perspective, but also that we really are able to provide socialization and ability for people to get together. There's a camp, Ellen Diamond runs a camp called Camp Gava, um, which is actually a great opportunity for younger children to be able to get together with other queer, gender non-conforming, non-binary, trans individuals and be able to have those experiences. So. Love it. So Gabby reminds me of some very important messages is that we actually stand in Long Island on the shoulders of those individuals who have been out in the community here in Long Island and advocating for the trans community for many, many years. And even though um, the work that I'm doing is relatively new from 2016, the trans community has lived in Long Island for a very long time. And there's been individuals that have been here for many, many years. And it's important that as we're creating these systems of engagement, that we not only create those engagement resources for us, but also for engaging younger families, older adults, people that have kids that have a transgender parent and what they're able to do. And all of these communities need to be brought together and we need to be able to partner with the other LGBT agencies and the other community agencies to kind of make this work together. We've been advocating for changes in terminology across the board. So in 2019 in the health system, we actually able to start asking every person that walked in our health settings um, at Northwell Health, what is your gender assigned at birth and what is your current gender identity? If they're the same, then there's no additional questions. But if they're at all different, then it's important that we're able to ask people other information. Please, Wendy. Yeah. Uh, is this covered, the, um, all of the treatment covered by insurance? How so according to both ACA as well as executive order within New York State, most of the treatments are completely covered by medical coverage. That includes hormone affirming therapy of all types. It also includes um, the top and bottom surgery. There are other surgeries that are sometimes seen as more cosmetic, which are not typically covered, even though that is changing some. And there's also, depending on the reason why people have surgery, the key concept is, is that- too. Yeah. I mean, if you get enough psychologists, exactly. the, if you have enough backup- The you key concept is, is that if you have gender dysphoria as the reason why you need the surgery, then that is the motivating factor saying that this is not only for your physical well-being, but also for your mental health well-being, and they are typically covered, but I'm it's- I'm going to turn it back to the host, but people are saying they can't do it. And you have to be persistent in your medical care. You have to advocate for yourself. I've had sometimes multiple years fights with the company before it was approved. And that's also uh, very disheartening, and I'll be occurring in the fight, you know, in that sense. Mm. It is traumatizing in many ways, but you have to be persistent in order to, because the rules are there, the guiding guidelines is, is the Medicaid guidelines, and there, from there the insurance companies take their hold. So I can read chapter and verse what the guidelines are, but to actually then prove it to the medical board and the insurance companies. Oh, it takes forever. Rhonda, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me properly? Phil, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me properly? Put it by your head. I can hear you. Thank you so much. That's great. All right, good. Um, I just 
we are running a little over, and this is an incredible um, conversation. I want to really thank you both. I'm going to turn this over to Cindy in a minute, but I'd like to make a suggestion because I think that you both have so much to offer that it would be wonderful if you could share some of the resources with us and we could put it up um, within the social action and perhaps also the sisterhood um, so that people who want knowledge or know how to connect, that the information would be there. Um, so I thought that would be a wonderful thing for you. Seems great. Yeah. I know you have all the connects. <laughs> That's fine. We'll, we'll uh, make more. Yes, but I think you've got pretty good connects. I, I think, you, I think <laughs> you've got a lot, of, a lot of good stuff too. It's great. Okay. Um, Cindy? Thank you. Tonight's three-pronged presentation created an illuminating experience, laying the groundwork for those attending to understand the internal and external challenges that the transgender community encounters. Rabbi Kara Weinstein Rosenthal, thank you. You are the perfect person to begin the program as you have a unique way of teaching with compassion and guide and which is one of the guiding principles of Jewish learning. And Jessica, um, <laughs> Jessica Potak, thank you. Your candidness and vulnerability tonight allowed many to walk with you through your journey to become yourself. Thank you for trusting all those in attendance tonight with your open heart. You are a beautiful woman with a beautiful soul. And Dr. David Rosenthal, thank you. Your willingness to share this information with our community with sensitivity, respect, and professionalism is another reason why we are so grateful that you and your family are part of our community. Yasha Koach and Wendy Yeagerheim, thank you for chairing the Social Action Committee at our synagogue and for recognizing that the best way to fight hate is to educate. And to those attending either in person or virtually, thank you. Thank you for opening your minds, your hearts, to listen to tonight's presentation. It is the hope that you will take away something that will help you begin to understand the transgender community. And if you are still struggling to understand, then there is the hope that you will continue to try. Tonight was a great beginning. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, then you're invited to check out the synagogue's calendar of events online in the what's happening section of the TBS website and we encourage you to register and learn with us together again and all those in the chapel are now invited to enjoy coffee and dessert in the gallery and we just ask that you remain masked until you're seated at a table to enjoy a sip a snack and a schmooze and thank you all for joining tonight's program I will and I do want to mention, I was supposed to say this earlier, but I think we were so excited um, about the sponsorships um, that you know, I also wanted to mention that there were close to 65 in attendance tonight. Um, and an overwhelming response is testimony to the need for this kind of programming and sisterhood in partnership with Temple Beth Shalom Social Action Committee are very grateful to tonight's gold and silver sponsors. All sponsors are listed on the back cover of tonight's program, and some are sitting in the chapel with us tonight, and some were joining us virtually. And thank you. Thank you for stepping forward and giving with an open hand and an open heart. And the sponsorship funds will bring other educational programs, such as the one you listened to tonight, to the community. And your gifts are accepted graciously and with appreciation and purpose. And now, thank you all again for joining, and I want to say good night to our virtual viewers, and the night is yet young for those in the chapel. Let's have a snack. <laughs>